Thanks. Welcome to the Divine Line, a Friday afternoon edition. We are doing uh, questions that have been sent in primarily via Twitter. And uh, last I looked, when I posted this, there were over 60 responses to it. Do the math. We're not going to get to all of them. <laughs> and I'll sort of go first come, first serve. So I'll start at the bottom as best I can. I have found that even using the Twitter interface on the web, um, at times I just don't see things and I'm not sure why, um, or they show up much later, don't know why, but I'll do the best I can and uh, we'll go from there. But the first question uh, actually comes from another source, but similar source to Twitter, I guess, uh, text message. Anyways, uh, on the last program, you may recall that we looked at a tweet from Jamar Tisby, the head of what used to be called Wrong, the Reformed African American Network now, uh, The Witness. And uh, I mentioned the fact that we've been able to chart uh, Jamar's movement into other perspectives over the past number of years. Um, I would call it a radicalization, in essence. Uh, but he had tweeted on August 4th, given the depth of theological miseducation when it comes to race and white churches, a brief sermon series on race before you get back to your regularly scheduled programming isn't going to cut it. We need to consistently address racial justice for months and years at a time. My criticism had primarily been that this is not what you find in Scripture. You do not find any foundation for ever uh, saying to a, a particular to the church in a particular nation, um, you should abandon the balance provided by Scripture itself on all the different aspects of the gospel, the application of the gospel, sanctification, all these different areas, and just focus on this one area primarily because of what happened in your great, 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 great grandparents' time, because you haven't acknowledged properly enough what happened to your great, 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 great grandparents' time. Of course, when you think about how many people died during the Civil War, uh, you would think that that might have some relevance to the price that's already been paid in regards to that situation, but it doesn't. Um, the narrative is that there needs to be, well, you've got people talking about reparations today, you know, all the rest of this kind of stuff in regards to um, racial reconciliation. And I have emphasized especially since 2018, before then, but especially since 2018, I have, I've emphasized that this demand fundamentally undercuts how unity was created and preserved in the early church. In the early church, you had many different ethnic groups brought together under the power and the aegis of the Roman Empire. Rome's awesome military power forced many people who had been involved in horrific genocidal war for generations to stop their warring and to get along with one another. Because you may hate that other tribe a lot, but them Romans have got weapons that you don't got, and you can't fight them, and they say stop fighting, so you stop fighting. What happens when you get people from that tribe over there and this tribe over there hearing the gospel, believing in Messiah Jesus, and coming into the one church, and you have the Lord's Supper where everyone comes together to remember the one Savior, his one sacrifice, the one righteousness that gives us peace before God? How does that work? if it is appropriate to be constantly looking back at and nursing in your own thinking the wrongs that have been done to your great-great-great-grandparents. The table demonstrates 
that the unity of the body is a forward-looking unity. It's backward-looking in the accomplishment of the one Messiah, the accomplishment of the drama of redemption. But it's forward-looking to what it creates, and that is a unified body based on that one finished work in Christ. That's how the unity was created and preserved. That's how you could have masters and slaves at the same table. That's how you could have people in the highest echelons of the uh, society and those who had nothing. You could have those in the army and those who were under the boot of the people in the army. You could, And then, as Colossians 3 says, you can have barbarians and Scythians. And barbarians and Scythians are ethnic designations. Barbarians were anyone out on the, the borders of the Roman Empire that did not speak Latin or Greek. Um, and they were, they were the barbaros. They were the barbarians uh, because their language was, they, they didn't fit in. And yet they were carrying the gospel. And Paul's teaching is there is one renewal of the spirit of God for all of these, including the barbarians, the Scythians, who were very warlike people, came out of the Russian steppes. People in Colossae would have known about them. And as they come to know Christ, they are brought into the fellowship. And you don't look at their history, their past, and say, before you can do this, you need to spend years repenting for what your great-great-great-grandparents did to these people's great-great-great-grandparents. So once you create this ungospel of the woke church, now you're stuck with the real problem. Because, as I said, this is why I say, there's no endgame. There's no conclusion here. How much repenting is enough? Even if I could repent from my ancestors, which I can't, I, I can show you, I can bring up on the screen, I can show you pictures of my ancestors scratching a meager living out of the soil of Nebraska, having come here after the Civil War from Scotland. So they weren't, they weren't a part of all that. Um, but, but even if you could say, well, you had to have had some ancestors that did something. Well, maybe, I don't know, neither is anybody else. No one, no one really has that kind of clarity. Almost no one has that, really, that kind of clarity as to exactly what all their ancestors did. The idea of anybody who's done Ancestry.com knows you run into dead ends. It, it gets better and better, but it's still you run into dead ends. That, how much repenting? are you supposed to do? Look at the Southern Baptist Convention. They've already passed how many resolutions and statements that, that what the, their great, great, great grandparents did in the convention because the Southern Baptist, you know, they split with the Northern Baptist over this issue. So you had the different conventions, things like that. The Northern Baptists ended up being wild eyed liberals. Um, but Southern Baptists, big thing among the Southern Baptists is the, slave owners and anybody who's a slave owner is automatically in many people's minds automatically, automatically now not even a christian that there was a really deep soteriological issue there that, that goes all the way back to the new testament it makes you go so philemon wasn't a christian oh that's interesting i'm not sure i got a letter in the new testament but anyway uh but there are people that are at that point now and they're saying repentance has to be done okay is it done once because what Tamar Tisby is saying is, no, we need to consistently address racial justice for months and years at a time. And the problem is, there's no end. Because this is based upon a, an idea of reconciliation that's not a biblical idea of reconciliation. We have been reconciled. If you are in Christ, reconciliation is a reality. It's not something you're working for. So... If you are in Christ, what? You're a new creature. You're a new creation. That's, that's a forward-looking stance, not a backwards-looking stance. But the woke church will not look forward at all because there's nothing to look forward to. 
its fundamental central affirmation of critical theory has no redemptive element to it. So one group in the church will be in constant penance toward another group in the church forever. Ask someone who is woke, how much is enough? Because what Jamar is saying is, hey, it doesn't even matter if you say you're woke and you do a whole sermon series. If you go back to talking about something else that means you didn't do enough, this wokeism becomes definitional of these people. It, it's, it's why they get up in the morning. It's why they do what they do. And that's dangerous. It's destructive. It's destructive to everybody that's involved with it. Um, so, you know, the, you know, the people say, what, what, was the American church that bad? Well, yes and no. There is a certain narrative. And there were certainly people who had a, there, there were people who interpreted the Bible in the light of their economic necessities, okay? So, you, you, I, I retweeted a link to an article about George Washington, because George Washington owned slaves. George Washington was the single most important founding force in the creation of the United States of America, the nation that has given more freedom to more people on the earth than any other nation that's ever existed. I think that could be easily defensible if you were allowed to do that kind of thing these days. But he owned slaves. So there are people who want his name, you know, no more Washington, D.C., no more Washington Monument, da 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 the problem is, it's not that simple when you look at the phases that he went through and the struggles that the, he didn't want slavery in the United States, but he wanted the United States more than he wanted something that would never come into existence. And so there had to be compromise, and there was. But there wasn't just one monolithic view of slaves of the black race. I mean, even during the Civil War, you can find whites in the South who owned slaves that had higher views of the black man as a human being than liberal whites in the North that condemned the South, but felt that the blacks were an inferior race that we should be shipped back to Africa. In fact, that was a major element in the thinking of many Northern abolitionists was what we really need to do is just ship them all back. And there was even, as you may know, certain efforts to try to do that kind of, you know, Liberia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's just, it's significant. Washington was significantly more complex the whole situation was significantly more complex than you're even allowed to talk about today. If you even say today what I just said, that is, there were multiple views and there were, were people on this side that had a higher view of, of blacks than people on this side that had a lower. If you even say that, you're just automatically, you're just a racist and... You, you just need to be canceled and, and so, so on and so forth. That's, that's where we are, but that's the historical reality. Uh, were there racist churches? Were there, you know, where did the division come from? It's funny, we, we look at the division in the churches and we know that there were churches that sought to not have division, that recognized the biblical teaching. Once you, once you believe, firmly recognize that we are all made in the image of God, there is no basis to the separation of churches. There just isn't. Um, and there have always been people who didn't want to see that happen. They wanted to see churches that are not integrated, because that's, that's done by some 
need to have a certain percentage here, a certain percentage there. But have churches that are freely made up of those whom the Spirit of God calls, and people who see the, the beauty and necessity of sound preaching come to where they're getting the sound preaching. Today, sadly, um, there are many black Christians who support the idea of a segregated church. In fact, the only people that I know that support the idea of a segregated church are black Christians. Well, maybe some Asian Christians too. Um, but I don't know of any white Christians who would say we need to have a white church. We need to have white spaces rather than black spaces. I, I don't know of any. There may be some. But I know major names of, of black Christian leaders who do believe there, there need to be churches that are just black spaces where there are no white voices so you can have uh, safety and uh, so on and so forth. So um, the reality is that only 15, 20 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of peace. And there was great progress that had been made, and, and, and then things changed. And that change came from outside the church, but has influenced deeply what's going on in the church. And that's a, a really problem. Uh, that's a real problem. So the history of the view of people in the church on this is complex. It is in England, for example. Um, but that's a completely different context than looking at Canada versus the United States, the North, the South. And then we forget that there are churches elsewhere. Um, churches in Brazil, in the Caribbean, where the majority of enslaved blacks were actually sent during the slave trade itself. There are actually churches there that you have to take a look at. Unfortunately, in our day, unless it happened in the United States, it's almost never even really considered to be relevant. Um, but the church has flourished even in times of slavery. And the, the exhortation of scripture is, if you find yourself in that position, honor God, don't be a man pleaser, and seek to bring about your, your own freedom. And when you have, Christianity laid the foundation for the destruction of that system in the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper. The very thing that is now being ignored in our day, sadly. That tells you, I think, a lot about that particular situation. Okay, uh, sort of uh, along the same lines, uh, one of the first questions that I see anyways, like I said, I'm just looking at what's there. What is the proper biblical way to speak to your church leaders when you see them recommending all the usual woke books and speakers, especially if you are a single woman? Yeah. Um, as with anyone who asks about leaving a church, for example, you your ideal is that you want any conversation to be amenable to uh, reconciliation and continued fellowship. And so you want to ask meaningful questions. I don't think being a single woman means that you have less of an appropriate uh, concern to express these, these things. You go to the elders. I would suggest talking to more than one elder at a time. And you ask what the, what the reasoning is behind the selection of the spectrum of materials addressing this issue. So for example, uh, why, aren't, why isn't there more dis, uh, sources being recommended uh, from the other side, has, has our church made the decision that we're not going to listen to what Bodhi Balcom says about this? We're not going to um, 
support the idea, the ideas expressed in the statement of social justice in the gospel. Uh, issues like that, and and get get some serious answers to why there is a consistency on only one side. And if you wish to express a concern, you know, be prepared to say some of the things that I said a few moments ago about where you see this leading, where you see that the, the woke movement has no end game. There's no, it's just a constant thing. Um, you know, ask the question, well, if, if we go this direction, can we, will what we do today mean that we will not be doing this a year from now? What, what, is, what is the final result of all this stuff? And then listen to the responses. And then you have to make the decision yourself, is this becoming, is, it, is this coming from a place that means that the fundamental ministry of the word is being compromised? Because I would say, if a church embraces Jamar Tisby's perspective and Jamar Tisby's recommendation and just simply goes wall to wall 24 seven racial justice for months and years at a time. Um, time to time to move on because that that church has lost its balance and has lost connection with the one source that can give it balance. And that is the ministry of the word of God. Because now you have an overriding interpretive grid and a social cause that is considered to be more important than the balanced ministry of the word that comes from the verse by verse exposition of scripture um, that you'd find in, in the, you, know, you need to be spending time in Hebrews, you need to be spending time in Romans, and those books aren't about. 21st century America. And so that's something to, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, eventually, um, you do have to consider whether you're able to continue on in, in a church where that is happening. Uh, next question I see here, uh, struggling with this question, can a biblical Christian date a liberal Christian? who doesn't hold the same values. I love this girl with all my heart, and it hurts that being obedient might mean breaking up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, can, I can tell you, um, honestly, that when, when you say, I love this girl with all my heart, you're, you're probably a, a younger man. And I fully remember Believe it or not, I, I do remember being a young man, uh, despite the fact that um, I'm moving quickly toward my 40th wedding anniversary. But uh, you, you do not forget the, the thrill of holding her hand and, um, and, and all of that. I, I get all of that. But you also need to recognize that you have to have a firm foundation in the same faith. Now, I don't know what liberal Christian means here, but I would recommend to you the reading of a book titled Liberalism and Christianity by J. Gresham Machen. It's an older book, but it has been demonstrated more than once to be true. And that is that liberalism and Christianity are two different religions. They really are. Oh, may be using the same language, but the foundational affirmations are so different that you are building a huge gap into your foundation from the start. That's just that's just a fact. I mean, it's it's it literally is almost the same as saying. 
well, I love this girl, but she's not a Trinitarian. Well, that's not a negotiable. And these days, liberal Christian normally means someone who doesn't believe God has spoken, doesn't believe the Bible is consistent, believes most of its mythology, um, spiritualizes the resurrection, and as a result, just has no real foundation for reformation. It's, it, it's starting in a very different place. And so my, my concern is you need to look past the current point and just ask a, a simple question. Is, am I, am I dating a believer who really does believe that Jesus Christ rose physically from the dead on the third day? In most liberal churches, that's, you, you have to, you may have to push a little bit, you may have to dig a little bit. I'll, I'll never forget when, when Jim Renahan and I did the debate with John Don McCrossin and, and Marcus Borg on the resurrection, it took half of the debate before all of a sudden, I think it was John Dominic Crossan during the cross-examination goes, so do you really, are you saying that his body was no longer in the tomb? <laughs> and we're like, yes, that's, yeah. Because they, if, especially if she was raised in a liberal church, there's such a framework already established that spiritualizes all of that, that you have to, it's just like, honestly, it's just like dealing with the Mormons. You have to define your terms. And so uh, I, I would say you're, you're sailing in very dangerous waters, very, very dangerous waters. Um, yeah. Be, be careful. Um, Interesting, there are two, uh, what do you call these things? Screenshot posts, something like that. From David K. Bernard. Now we, uh, for those who are not familiar with the name, David K. Bernard is really the leading the theologian in the United Pentecostal Church International, UPCI, which is based in the uh, St. Louis area, St. Louis, St. Charles, that area. They just moved their headquarters somewhere. Uh, we have, attempted more than once to arrange a full-on debate. He and I did two radio debates oof, years ago. Uh, I don't list them as quote-unquote debates. They weren't long enough, the, the, the radio-type situations. Um, but his book, The Oneness of God, has for a long time anyways been sort of the standard uh, work within the UPCI theologically speaking, and again, to explain to new listeners or uh, people who have not heard this before, oneness Pentecostal, and the oneness position is a denial of the doctrine of the Trinity. It is uh, the teaching that, at least in their form, because uh, there's different, historically, back in the early church, you had patropassionism, you had Sabellianism, you had uh, dynamic monarchianism, and there could be subtle differences between how people understood that and made application. The UPCI is oneness or Jesus only. So, for example, you hear one say you're only baptized in Jesus' name, not to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in Jesus' name only. That's almost always a oneness position. Uh, but the oneness position itself, as enunciated by Bernard, would be that you have only one God, but Jesus is two persons. So they would say they believe in the deity of Christ, but that the deity of Christ was that the human aspect of Jesus was the Son, and he was indwelt by the Father. So instead of having the doctrine of the Trinity, where you have three co-equal and co-eternal persons who eternally exist in relationship to one another, they deny the existence of persons in that way. 
they do not believe. You can always tell one this Pentecostalism, one this teaching, by asking, do you believe that the three eternal persons have eternally existed in intimate fellowship with one another? They cannot affirm that because they do not believe. So you ask um, certain well-known people like T.D. Jakes, does he believe that? And he will say, well, I don't like the term persons. Well, the reason he doesn't like the term persons is because he's not a Trinitarian. Um, that's the problem. And so you'll, you'll see this kind of, of perspective uh, popping up in, in various places, even in Christian music. Uh, uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean came out of oneness churches. And one of them was the oneness minister and has continued to affirm plainly and clearly oneness theology, denial of the doctrine of the Trinity. So uh, David K. Bernard is one of their leading intellectuals. I remember I, I played, oh, what was it now, 2016? Somewhere in there. I, I played a, a clip from someone recording. It may have been an online thing that Bernard was doing. And I was prominent in it. We, ha we have not actually communicated in decade and a half, maybe. And it was that debate that we did. But I, I still live rent-free <laughs> amongst, uh, amongst the leadership of the UPCI. And we can take care of that if we just get together and actually do a, a formal debate. But uh, so that's the background. David K. Bernard, uh, Joseph uh, says, what is your opinion on this? Were they saved by acting or by deciding to be disciples? I believe this is important because many people idolize this man and hang on, uh, hang on to every word he says. Well, obviously... I believe that when it comes to David K. Bernard, the point is who he believes God is leads to fundamental soteriological issues. The United Pentecost Church International is thoroughly opposed to the doctrines of grace, the Reformation. Uh, they believe in speaking in tongues as a necessary uh, element of things, and there is a deep and strong commitment to a work salvation system within the UPCI. So the first uh, screen cap, I guess is what they're called. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew to become disciples, he said, follow me. They became his disciples only in the act of obedience. And then below that is another screen cap. It says, if Noah had tried to be saved merely by intellectual agreement and verbal profession instead of act of obedience to God's command, he would have drowned. Now, both statements are self-evidently true, but they also are self-evidently insufficient to deal with the biblical teaching concerning man. Um, I truly believe that the only balanced way of answering the issue of the relationship between faith and works is in Reformed theology. I believe that any synergistic system will collapse either into utter incoherence or a work salvation system eventually. Only by recognizing the sovereignty of God in election, the deadness of man and sin, can you have a proper foundation for seeing how all of this is supposed to work together. And so we, we have the overarching statement of the Apostle Paul in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works that a man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So there you have everything you need. You have the utter sovereignty of God as the source of everything that we need. Grace, salvation, and faith. The reason that in Ephesians 2.8, Paul uses a neuter demonstrative pronoun there is he is wrapping up everything that came in the preceding portion of the verse. And so that when he says that not of yourselves, that includes but is not limited to grace, salvation, and faith. 
Faith is included. You cannot exclude it from what is said. Faith is a gift of God. Saving faith is a gift of God. So uh, that comes from God. You start with the sovereignty of God. You start with his initiative. That's not a works. Lest any man should boast. It comes from grace. For we are his workmanship. We are the, the, the term, I'm, I don't have it up on my screen right now, but it's, I think it's from Poya or Poyema. Um, we are what he has formed and created. For we are the result of his initial extension of power. We are his workmanship created only in Christ Jesus, exclusively in Christ Jesus, not in anything else. So you can't come up with pluralism here. You can't come up with anything like that. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. There is a purpose for why God saves us. He could just save us and zap us right out of the world, right into his presence. But he has chosen not to do so. He is glorifying himself through the mechanism of building the body of Christ and using us as his instruments of bringing his message to others. And so good works, active obedience is central. That's why the whole free grace movement, the anti-lordship movement, simply heretical. You can have all the good motivations for it you want in the world. It's still heretical. It is grossly imbalanced. It is fundamentally opposed to biblical teaching. Now, if you don't have the balance of Ephesians 2, you end up falling off on one of the two sides. You either end up in the libertarian, free grace, tip your hat toward God, get your ticket punch, doesn't matter what you do after that, you're going to heaven side, or off into the myriad of synergistic, cooperative, God tries to save, but it's ultimately up to you, all the way through to the full-on semi-Pelagians and Pelagians. You got the whole spectrum that you end up with there uh, when you when you fall the other direction. As far as I can see, the only position that holds that together is one that is laid out for us there in Ephesians chapter 2, or Romans or Galatians, it's all over the place, but that particular text provides a wonderful summary of what it means to be balanced along those lines. And so um, the question is not, uh, you know, if Noah had tried to be saved merely by intellectual agreement and verbal profession, see, if you don't recognize that God is the one who regenerates, that God is the one who takes out the heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh, that God is the one who raises you to spiritual life, if you don't recognize the tremendous miracle of regeneration, which is done in baptism and speaking in tongues within Bernard's context, then you don't have a basis for recognizing the intimate connection between active obedience and free grace. Saved completely of free grace, but because that free grace is powerful and active, changes, redeems, regenerates, makes a new creature. And what does a new creature do? The new creature loves to do what is pleasing in the sight of his Lord and Savior active obedience that active obedience does not add to the power of that grace or the accomplishment of what christ has done but it is the natural outflow it is what god had before ordained predestining act of god right there in philippians in, in ephesians chapter two well it's in philippians chapter two as well uh for you have the same thing that's Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who will work within you to both the will and do according to his own good pleasure. Same thing, doesn't matter if it's Philippians 2 or Ephesians 2, happens to be in both. Um, the, if, you, if you don't see the priority of the grace of God behind all these things, Noah's situation, Peter's situation, Andrew's situation, 
you will always end up falling into these uh, these errors. And uh, certainly the UPCI does not have that balance and that therefore leads to uh, that, that conclusion. Um, no, I didn't say anything about Pope Francis and money from China. Nothing in 2020 would shock me. Um, when searching for a church to join, I'm just going backwards here. When searching for a church to join, what should be the main points to look for? What are the main theological points to look for? And where is there some wiggle room? Um, and do you know a good church in the Netherlands that you recommend to someone recently exposed to Calvinism? Well, I was just in the Netherlands. Well, it seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It really does, does seem like a lifetime ago that I was in the Netherlands. But I think it was 2019 that I was there. And so um, I could obviously recommend the folks there. Now, the funny thing is that, that you would ask this um, because when it says, do you know a good church in the Netherlands that you recommend to someone recently exposed to Calvinism? Because the Netherlands is where you have a really unique situation. You have the Bible Belt stretching across the Netherlands, where you have the old-time Reformed Calvinists that unfortunately many, not all, have lost their balance big time. So when I got there, I... So, so the guys that had me in are reformed in their theology. They believe in the sovereignty of God, but they're evangelistic. They preach the gospel. They want to preach the whole counsel of God, you know, just like just like us. And they're telling me about how you can go to a lot of the reformed churches, and when they have the Lord's Supper, almost no one partakes. Almost no one partakes. Um, why? Because they have developed a concept of perfection of repentance. And since no one has a perfection of repentance, then they don't think that they have repented sufficiently and properly so as to be able to partake of the suffering. Because there clearly is a call for repentance. There is an examination of oneself. But there is a command to partake and to believe and to recognize that it is Christ who has provided for us in that context. So there, there, there are a number of churches in the Netherlands that have fallen into what is called hyper-Calvinism. And it's a form of hyper-Calvinism that becomes sort of traditional over time, where you still have a good theology, but you've lost your balance. And as a result, you end up emphasizing certain aspects of things to the ex ex uh, at the expense of other aspects of biblical revelation. And so there would be a lot of Calvinistic churches in the Netherlands, as wildly secular and, and liberal as the Netherlands have become. There'd be a number of those, but you need to be careful that you find a church uh, that is going to be balanced in its application of those divine truths, because there are a number that are not. Evidently, they also some of those that are particularly imbalanced are also uh, absolutely demanding that you wear nothing but black or white uh, to church. No grays, no color, no nothing. I think that's a good sign to be watching for um, to, to avoid. So my answer to the questions about main points to look for, main theological points, wiggle room, stuff like that, if you hadn't mentioned the Netherlands, 
my answer wouldn't have been overly useful to you because I would have defaulted to an American context. So I'm, I'm glad that you did. That, that helped. Um, because really, my, my answer would be different in America. And it would be different in South Africa, Ukraine, Australia. Because it is interesting that in each one of those places, you will have uh, differing cultures and styles and current uh, controversies. I mean, we're all facing a lot of the same current controversies right now, globally, because of the virus and things like that. Uh, but then there are other local things that you have to keep an eye out for. And um, so I, I might be able to put you in contact with the contact people I had in the Netherlands. They might be able to help you out with that on Twitter. So, uh, in your Leighton Flowers debate, you ask him if he uses the same methodology to exegete his beliefs regarding man's ability to respond to God's call with other doctrines, and his response was no. I would love to, I assume, know what methodologies you referred to and how you knew his were different here. Well, the, the reason I knew that his were different there is because I have defended... Okay, there are only, there's only a certain way to defend the Trinity and the deity of Christ within non-sacerdotal systems. In other words, Roman Catholics, and this drives me crazy, drives me crazy. it's one of the most offensive things that, that I hear Roman Catholic apologists say, I struggle greatly to keep myself in control. Roman Catholics will frequently say that there's no way that you could ever uh, defend the Trinity, uh, the person, the Holy Spirit, things like that. Um, um, so I know that Leighton Flowers, as a Southern Baptist, I know what he professes to believe uh, based upon the Baptist faith and message. And I know how it's defended. And therefore, I know that the hermeneutical methodology that he and I both would have to use to come to the conclusions that we do on the doctrine of the Trinity is not the hermeneutical methodology he's using to respond to issues relating to um, the nature of man, the, the presentation he had made about Unfortunately, not Romans 9, uh, but his particular view of the autonomous nature of, of man. And so I, I just, I think that is a fatal flaw. I, I think once you start using a different methodology of interpretation, that is the greatest way to recognize the intrusion of tradition into what you claim is, is biblical teaching. So that's why I asked the question, and I appreciated the honest answer. I've been told, I mean, there is no way that I can keep up with the number of people who respond to things that I say on this program. I, I literally would never be able to do anything positive ever again. Positive in the sense of writing, research, um, sermons, uh, anything, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. So there's all sorts of people, the, the oneness Pentecostals will respond to what I just said. And, you know, King James only guys, I've got, I've got a clip, I'm not gonna play it this time, probably need to do a little more testing to see, but I, I've got a, a, a new King James only numerology clip. As soon as I play that, they'll respond. Uh, the Roman Catholics are are all up in arms about daring to point out what church history actually teaches in regards to Mary. And and they all are going to put out their, their videos and their debate challenges and you know, 
all the rest of that kind of stuff. That, that's just the nature of things today. Um, and so I have heard that Leighton has said, well, you're making, you're making too much out of what I said and has tried to tweak his response to that. But I, I think it's, it's self-evident that there is an external, I would call it tradition, theological position, that is driving how he interprets the text of the Bible on this matter. And that's the problem. That's, that's, that's what I said to Dave Hunt long ago. He called this a debate. It wasn't a debate. I was actually filling in for the afternoon drive time host on a local Christian radio station. I had been his guest so many times that I, I knew the studio real well. And we, I think we still had a Saturday program at this time, didn't we? Or had we just recently stopped doing that? I think we'd recently stopped doing that, now that I think about it. But I had been, I had been on air at this, this place more than once. In fact, I grew up doing radio, so that's being, how being a fill-in is, is, is easy for me. And so I was interviewing Dave Hunt about an article he had written against Calvinism. This was before he wrote What Love Is This? And in fact, he said that interview was important in his writing, What Love Is This? But as I attempted to deal with the dearly departed Dave Hunt on John chapter six, when he gave an answer to one of the verses in John chapter six, my response to him was, Dave, that's your tradition speaking. That's not what the text says. And his response to me was, James, I have no traditions. James, I have no traditions. There are a lot of people who think they don't. Everybody does. And I've been saying for 20 years now, because this, I think, was in 2000. It may have been 99, but 2000. Um, anyone who says they don't have traditions is a slave of their traditions. The, the less you recognize your traditions, the more you're enslaved to your traditions. And that was certainly the case with Dave Hunt. And that is uh, the case with Leighton Flowers as well. He has a very, very, very strong commitment to what I think is a fundamentally unbiblical view of man. And that determines the methodology of interpretation he's going to utilize. Um, so that's what I was referring to there. I think he would recognize the validity of my if I were to lay out a historical grammatical understanding of hermeneutics, he'd have a hard time arguing that. He'd have a hard time arguing against that. He'd say, oh, that, 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 that is how we should do it. But does he do so consistently is uh, the question. Uh, where is the Trinitarian language of God as one in being derived exegetically from the biblical text? Well, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Uh, here, O Israel, um, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is Echad, he is one. The biblical teaching of monotheism, that there is only one creator God who has eternally existed, is part of the absolutely fundamental element of revelation that we have in the pages of Scripture. And so... Once we understand the name given to God in the Old Testament is Yahweh, we then see that that one name is then used of Father and Son and Spirit in the New Testament. And yet you still have the assertion there is one, one God. Then we recognize the necessity of differentiating between being, that which makes God God, the nature of God, and the persons that share that one being, the Father who is differentiated from the Son, is differentiated from the Spirit. And so again, the doctrine of the Trinity is a revealed doctrine. It is a doctrine of revelation. You would not come to the doctrine of the Trinity if you did not have what we call special revelation or the Scriptures. It is derived from sola scriptura and tota scriptura. Scripture alone and all of Scripture. And so the one being of God is simply derived from the reality of monotheism. There is one God who's created all things. And so once the New Testament then begins to reveal to us 
other aspects. It gives uh, in John 1, 1, in Philippians chapter 2, in Colossians 1, in Hebrews chapter 1, you have that, Philippians chapter 2, the, the drawing aside of the veil of eternity. And we, John chapter 17, we get to see into the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity past. This is the level of, of revelation that you only have prophetically given to you in the Old Testament. You do not have it given as the substance of revelation. And so you, you get this in light of the incarnation of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is really the fundamental proof of the doctrine of the Trinity, is historically in the incarnation of Jesus, the Son, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So my answer to the question would be, in the, in the fundamental teaching of Scripture, for example, in Isaiah chapters 40 to 48, the trial of false gods, um, where you have one God. And then in light of the New Testament revelation, that that one God is not simplistic. That's not simple. Those are two different categories in theology. Simplistically Unitarian, but is in fact Trinitarian because the revelation that comes to us in Jesus. So any monotheistic, monotheistic text. The same person asked about 1 Samuel 18. I looked at 1 Samuel 18 and 2 Samuel 18. It had nothing to do with the question, so it must have been uh, provided. Um, must be the wrong wrong text. No, I'm not going to talk about head covers. Um how would you apply Romans 13 to a situation where God's ministers forbid singing in church services and communion and fellowship? So I'm assuming that you're utilizing language here, God's ministers, as the governmental ministers. And that's a different category than the ministers of the church. And there was an earlier question um, also about uh, Romans 13. Now, I, unfortunately, I see a, a tweet here. It says, in desperate need of advice, please, faith, dangerous, and slipping away, but there's no question asked. I just, I, sorry, I, I can't help and I can't see what the, what the there's no question. That's just above the question I'm answering. I was looking for the Romans 13 thing. Uh, I, I made a comment about Romans chapter 13, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with this because we're just going to go for an hour. Um, I, I made a comment, and, and a lot of people didn't seem to, to grasp it. I, I just threw it out there because there's a lot of, um, I think, somewhat simplistic and narrow applications of Romans chapter 13 being made. Uh, because in Romans chapter 13, I think what you have is the, the general principle that is to be applied across all cultures. That when you have a uh, governing authority, first of all, God is the one who establishes them. They are good. Anarchy is always bad. Um, but when it says, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, what happens when they become a cause of fear for good behavior? There, there, is, a, there is a description here of the government suppressing evil doing and rewarding good doing. When you enter into a situation, as we have today with the Chinese Communist Party, where the CCP specifically punishes good doing and rewards evil doing, promotes evil, promotes rebellion, how then does Romans chapter 13 function at that point? Is the question I was asking. Has anyone thought about this? There, there, you cannot take this to mean 
that there is unbridled authority for the government to do whatever it wants. And the church is just simply to meekly bow the knee to whatever the government says. Because the description, to, to say that uh, when it says, uh, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you'll have praise from the same. What if they jail you, kill you for doing good? Well, that's not a government that's being described here. Um, it says, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. We literally see places right now where the opposite is taking place. So what do you do in that context? Do you just simply up? You just have to have to submit. Or is there... Is this a much more complex situation than generally people are willing to allow? And has there been a period of time within just the past couple hundred years where there was much discussion of this? And, and we have to remember we, come, we are coming out of a sacral experience in Europe with our governmental system. Sacral experience. What is that? A joining of church and state. A joining of church and state. Rather than two sovereign spheres, there was a joining of church and state. And that led to lots of problems. And it did not help the church. And so we can go back to some of our Reformed forefathers who were living in a very different context. They, would, they could not possibly be, even begin to conceive of a secular, atheistic, governmental system where the government ministers refuse to acknowledge God and believe that we are nothing but cosmic accidents. So if you, if you grab their words and try to cram them into our situation, be careful. I think the result can be very, very, very confusing. So thank you for those questions. I know I didn't get to but a few of them, but I went down and then scrolled up to catch the ones that uh, that I could get to. And maybe some of you, you spent too much time on them. Well, um, sorry about that. Do the best we can on a Friday evening. Lord willing, we will be back next week with you. I do have some traveling to do. I'll be honest with you. I'm not... Looking forward to that a whole lot. Uh, travel used to be fun. It's, it's changed. A lot has changed. Will it ever get back to doing it? I don't know. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I do not know. But um, I think I leave on Thursday. Uh, right now is the plan. Uh, but also, one last quick thing. Uh, we do live stream. Uh, services from Apologia on Sunday afternoons, four o'clock on Standard Time. Uh, right now, that's um, seven o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And so Sunday afternoon, probably about 445, 450, uh, that will kick off and I will be preaching a sermon right now anyways, um, on the subject of the atonement something we've talked about a lot on this program but if you're new you might find that to be uh, useful so look up apology studios you'll be able to watch that online it might be uh, helpful to you. you might find that to be useful. so thanks for joining us on the vine line today we'll see you next time god bless <laughs>